here face to face, please feel free to contribute uh, any notes you may have on the A3 pages on your tables. Uh, but also, those of you tuning in online, please feel free to use the chat function again. Following Paul's presentation, we're going to have a quick intermission as we split the room into two. Over to you, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We'll see how we go technology wise. Um, again, welcome to everybody. Um, it is great to see people all in a room rather than, than on a screen. Yeah, if you just go down like that. Beautiful. Um, just a bit of a background on the strategy and, and what's led us to, to where we actually are here. If you remember back in, um, it's now 2018 19, we had an, a, an exceptionally high drowning toll. I think it was about the second or third highest on record at 56 drowning deaths. Um, that led the government of the day, still, still the current government, to um, put together a um, a round table to try and see if government was really working in unison together to address um, drowning and were there any efficiencies that could be gained by having people you know sit in one room and and have a discussion about um, you know the, the, yeah, the, the top. Top. that uh, yeah. that morphed into a task force that um, had, had led to the idea that the task force would be a governance group that would lead the next Victorian water safety strategy. Um, so, so again, that, that's back in 1819. Till then, the Victorian water safety strategy had been led by Life Saving Victoria on behalf of government and the aquatic industry. So it, it was a, a bit of a, a quantum shift in, in the approach to um, at, at how it might be addressed. Um, then in 1920, um, the uh, with the EMV Emergency Management Victoria had been tasked with the coordination role with Life Saving Victoria to, to pull that strategy together. They, we then had the, the bushfires um, came through and, um, and Emergency Management Victoria got tied up in two Royal Commissions, one being the National Royal Commission and then um, and also a, a local Royal Commission. They also then got, um, with the introduction of COVID, they got sidetracked again and um, then got have been tied up in Royal Commissions into how COVID was handled as well. So Emergency Management Victoria really, you know, found themselves um, under, under pretty heavy workload and subsequently um, just at the start of COVID back in March last year, they um, reprioritised the, the Victorian Water Safety Strategy to um, to the following year. Then subsequently, um, with um, what we could see coming down the barrel over summer and, and that prediction that we we're in for really um, a, a, an unseen year with not a lot of insight into what we were, we were going to expect um, with the COVID situation, um, we, we did some research and certainly had a good look at what was happening in the Northern Hemisphere, what was happening in the Northern States of Victoria and realised that we were probably in um, for a bit of a shock with people, you know, being let out of the lockdowns and the like and um, wanting to access our waterways. And certainly after the first um, release after being locked down, there was a real scramble on um, the responsibility for public safety on Crown land became became a real issue. Um, so, so again, then leading into this year now, we've, we've now got the highest drowning numbers on record. So after the weekend, it looks like we've got 44 drowning deaths in, in the state. Um, and, you know, we've still got four months to go. And, you know, unfortunately, it seems to be um, ticking them off on, on a weekly basis. So we're, we're in a, um, you know, unprecedented times with regards to our drain, drowning numbers. Um, and and there's there's sort of some different patterns that are starting to appear at, as a result of um, you know the, the the lockdown and then release from lockdown and not being able to travel and one of the early ones was um, children zero to fourteen where all of a sudden we'd been tracking really well on um, on kids and drowning deaths where all of a sudden they they really became elevated um, and I, and largely you know we're, we're hypothesizing it's been around that um, supervision fatigue of children in homes 
So whether it's um, baths or backyard pools or or whatever, we, we saw a real spike there. Um, also, the fact that you know swimming lessons, of course, were uh, were largely put on hold. So that's sort of a little bit of the background. Now, the, the task the task force is I presume the next slides it hasn't gone up there, but it's uh, it has gone on my screen. So. Um, I'll, I'll keep going. The, the, the task force is made up of, you know, at the moment there's about 19 government agencies. So it's a pretty, pretty big, um, you know, table of people who are coming together. All, all be a lot of them only have a really minor touch point to, to water safety. Um, I've just got a, a couple of examples. Hopefully the people online can actually see the, uh, the slide that I have up. But um, Emergency Management Victoria is, is the key one, you know, working with Life Saving Victoria in regards to um, the slides keep jumping around here. In regard to um, you know put, putting the whole thing together and Life Saving Victoria as the as the peak water safety body. There we go. Hopefully that makes some sense to people out there. Um, Department of en Environment, Land, Water and Planning, um, largely around um, land policy and public safety. So as I mentioned in, in COVID in particular, um, who's responsible for safety of people on public land and largely um, the public estate, you know, of, of the beaches and um, surrounding areas. So they're, they're definitely a key player. Esther, as um, as you know, the communications specialists with regards to tasking of um, to drownings and the like. Um, local government, Victoria, uh, working that conduit between state government and local government for, for filtering things down. Department of Environment, Land, Water and um, Planning on their planning arm with regards to um, backyard pool safety. Um, Vic Pol as, as the command agency for anything that happens in um, emergency services in the water space. Um, Department of Justice and um, Community Safety regarding um, looking after all the communications and the public awareness campaigns. Ambulance Victoria, um, Municipal Association Victoria, Parks Victoria, SES from a flood perspective in particular, um, DJPR, um, Sport and Rec with regards to you know aquatic centres and um, the, the activity of swimming. Transport Safety Victoria, um, Tourism Victoria, uh, Marine Rescue, Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, um, Multicultural, the Department of Premier and Cabinet, Department of Education and Training, who are, who are key partners. And now we're looking for a few of those other key groups and, and one that's been identified has been the TAC and what learnings we might be able to get from their, their alcohol campaigns, given that um, you know a third, roughly about a third of all drowning deaths um, involve um, excessive amounts of alcohol. Um, there may be other government departments that we're going to, um, to to go and tap on the shoulder. Certainly, um, the road safety campaign is a really similar um, strategy um, that they have have in place. So we'll, we'll certainly be talking to them. But it it is a big group of stakeholders. This only being the government stakeholders. So so then, um, you know, we'll be we'll working the draft of this strategy through. Um, these sort of industry forums and um, the state sporting associations and, and the other non-for-profits, you know, you know, like your kids safe and, and the like. So um, there is a lot of engagement to undertake. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the big difference this year is really going to be that um, it, it, the strategy is not, while it, it will be partnered by Life Saving Victoria, it's not going to be a Life Saving Victorian document, it will be a straight government document. The previous document, the forward, was um, or has always been written by the um, the Minister for, for Emergency Services, um, whereas the government's going to ha have a touch point right throughout the document this time. Um, currently, the Australian Water Safety Strategy is in final draft form, um, which will be, be released soon. And, and again, um, in regards to alignment, it's going to be a key piece of work that we, we align the new strategy with what's happening um, nationally. The national um, 
the national paper is again predominantly an industry driven um, paper. The Australian Water Safety Council is made up of a group not dissimilar to the Play It Safe by the Water Group. So what we're doing here in Victoria with this um, a, a government led strategy is certainly a first um, nationally. So there's some, some great opportunities that come up with regards to that. So where we, where we are at the moment is is really um, the, the stakeholder consultation plans being put to to government and been or to the task force, which, which is the governance group, and it's been been approved. Um, the risk and research department here at Lifesaving Victoria is um, is back um, doing some desktop top work, looking at at the last twelve months, looking at the last sort of five years, and and back to when we. Uh, Put the previous strategy in place back in 2000 and um, 2004 or 5 I think was the benchmark years that we used in, in trying to meet that goal of reducing drowning deaths by 50 percent. So the, the consultation stage, stage this is probably probably uh, the first kickoff of the second iteration um, and you know again from an industry perspective you know, we'll, we'll go to the plate safe by the water group and, and sort of open it up for consultation as much as we can. The government consultation, they want to wait until after Easter where they think they're going to, they'll have a better idea on, um, you know, absolute drowning numbers and, and trends over this summer. So that will start then. And as, as I mentioned, everything will be um, taken back and, and fed through the water safety task force, which at the, at the moment is meeting for hopefully we'll be moving to monthly um, and we ratified before it gets pushed up um, through the, um, the the government channels which are complicated um, so with regard to endorsement and finalization it eventually has to end up at the, the state crisis and resilience committee and then the the state emergency management committee to to be signed off um, and again you can see we're really looking I would think it'll be around the towards the end of August that we'll get something finalised. The key key things are that it, it needs to be a whole of sector document. As I said it can't it can't be just a, a government document. It's got to got to have an industry component and a community component. The um, and and again that's the unique opportunity here. If you look through the last two iterations. Victorian water safety strategy. There's things in there that says governance to, um, uh, you know, work, work with government to try and achieve a goal. Um, here we're getting the opportunity to actually try and put it in, get government to actually um, commit to a, to a particular um, task or action. So, and again, you know, it's, it's always been about advocacy, advocacy to government to do ABC. Now is the opportunity to get government to, to actually put in their work plans that they will address water safety in a particular way. So um, it certainly, in theory, should take take a lot of the frustration out of, of um, you know lobbying government for pieces because we've got a task force that they will agree to the all need to agree to the strategies and feed into their own individual work plans across government. So. It, it's a bit of an intricate web, but it is certainly um, an amazing opportunity to see, you know, what sort of effect that can have. Um, we also want to, um, you know, highlight what we're actually currently doing well. Um, there'll be, a, a, as I mentioned earlier, a, quite a research component, again, looking nationally and abroad. Um, and we ne also need to see where we're actually missing data, you know, what, what information do we actually need that we don't have that we don't gather um, and again by putting it into the task force um, including it in the strategy there's a push to have to deliver whereas you know things like research tends to always be the last piece that that you know that we actually get to done we're all to get to do we're, we're doing it retrospectively often whereas here we're able to put it up the front and say unless we know this you know we're not going to be able to um, achieve something else so consider what actions or potential actions would be appropriate to, to highlight within a new strategy. Now, it, we need some lateral thinking pretty much on, um, on on ways that we can we can do things 
officially, clearly we've got 53, 53 drowning deaths, albeit as Andy will be very glad about, none of them have been in swimming pools and swimming pools are the safest place. But certainly there, um, you know, that, that primary area where people go to, to learn to swim and, um, you know, the, there's, there's no doubt that, you know, the effects that that have, um, has on the drowning numbers. Um, the research department has crunched a, a few numbers at, at the moment to include last year um, and compare it to when we, we did the previous strategy. So um, I'm not going to go through them all. We'll make this slide set available later. Um, you, you can see the uh, the ones in red there, you know, reduced drowning in males, 25 to, to 64. So this is the average of the three years against the, the benchmark set back for the previous strategy, um, back against 2004-2007. So again, the urgent work needed, reduced Drownings in inland waterways, reduced drowning in coastal waterways. Uh, priority goals, again, um, boating and watercraft accidents and um, high risk populations. So again, that's our multicultural audiences. The, the structure, uh, we had gone down quite a pathway with regards to, to the structure of, of how we would pull this together, having looked at, um, you know, the World Health Organization, um, the International Life Saving Federation, and this safe systems framework, which currently the national um, um, work on a state systems framework, the, um, the national marine strategy actually also works on state systems framework as does the New Zealand road strategy also is uh, is on that. And we were pretty much down down that path um, back in late, late March, but we've been asked to go back and re revisit it. Um, part of the initial work is going to actually go back and, and have a look at things within government, you know, what legislation there is, standard codes, lines, policies, procedures, day-to-day -day ops, so that we've actually got a clear accountability and responsibility um, you know, it's interesting over the years, you know, Parks Victoria is an example, um, are more worried about a tree falling down on someone in a car park where their car's parked than the safety of the, the waterway that sits within their park. So there's um, some, you know, some clear accountability needs to be highlighted throughout the strategy, in particular public safety on public uh, land, I think is, a, is going to be a key one. So the safe systems framework would then broken down into you know safer aquatic environments, better prepared people, stronger partnerships and, and collaboration. And we'll, we'll get to that in, in a little while, but I'll, I'll just quickly um, run through that structure of, of the World Health Organization. Um, 10 steps to preventing, preventing drowning. Um, you're probably all quite familiar with it, but there's um, six activities and four um, strategies. Just race through them, six interventions and four strategies. Uh, it, it is more geared to third world countries and developing um, nations. So there is some modifications that need to be um, slightly tweaked in regards to our, our environment here in, in Australia and Victoria. Um, I'll just quickly read out just the, the top line of this. You won't expect to read it, but it's um, the first intervention is provide safe places away from water. For, preschool children with capable childcare. Um, second one is install barriers controlling access to water. Third is teach school aged children aged over six years swimming and water safety skills. Um, fourth is build resilience and manage flood risks and other hazards. The fifth is train bystanders in safe rescue and resuscitation. Six, set and enforce safe boating, shipping and ferry regulations. And, and the policy pieces are to promote multi-sectoral collaboration, to strengthen public awareness of drowning through strategic communications, establish a national water safety drowning prevention plan, hence what we're doing here, um, and research is advanced drowning prevention through data collection and well-designed studies. So um, that uh, World Health Organization paper is 
from early 2000s now, but certainly those t six interventions and four strategies still still all absolutely um, stand true. Um, if anyone can think of um, something that's covered off in, in those 10, that, that's what we'd love to actually hear about. The uh, International Lifesaving Federation, they, they've put theirs together just a little bit different, though, though again, they align. Um, and that's really um, more at nations that actually have an established um, life saving service you know, in, in their country. And the four factors that commonly lead to, to drownings in, in their, their structure is lack of knowledge, disregard or misjudgment of the hazard, uninformed, unprotected or unrestricted access to the hazard, lack of supervision or surveillance, and an ability to cope once in difficulty. So, so again, you can see how they certainly align with the World Health Organization ones. Um, and and their, their four strategies to, to address these risks are education and information, denial or access and or provision of warnings, provision of supervision and acquisition of survival skills. So again, there's a lot on that slide, um, not expected to, to read it. Now, the safe systems framework, um, you know, as I said, it underpins the national road and marine safety strategies. Um, and there's so much in the road strategy where if you just took out road and put water, that all of a sudden make it very relevant, would make it very easy to write the strategy. Um, and certainly the, the resourcing that's gone into it, into the road, national road strategy is, uh, is going to be a much bigger budget than what, what we'll no doubt get for water safety. But it's really based around that, that people make mistakes. So some aquatic incidents are inevitable due to the erratic forces of our environment and human behaviour and how the two interact. Um, now, Senior from LSV said, are you not going to swear in your presentation today? And I'm going to try not to, but that's uh, people make mistakes is certainly your shit happens scenario. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, Mother Nature throws something out of the ocean at you and, and it's trouble. Um, second one is people are vulnerable. Human bodies have the ability to withstand submersion and exposure to weather conditions. Some people are more vulnerable than others, depending on age, fitness, competency, and knowledge. The third one there is that uh, safety is a shared responsibility and a key one in the community government um, industry partnership in that there's um, almost three lots of strategies that need to be put in place. What's the government strategy? What's the aquatic industry strategy? And, and what's the community responsibility and strategy, you know, in, in, um, in trying to reduce the numbers? So community plays an important role in ensuring its own safety. The aquatic industry plays a role not only in providing safe venues, education and information for, drown for drowning prevention, but also addresses resilience, health, social and wellbeing issues associated with being in, on and around water. Governments provide policy and enforcement to manage and keep our waterways safe. The last one is that all parts of the system must be strengthened. Um, and here we're talk really talking about infrastructure, safety equipment, um, enforcement, risk management, policy, research, preparedness and response, access and egress, communication structures, management and coordination. So a strong system will ensure that if one part fails, other parts will still protect the people involved. So just trying to put that now into the um, all that theory side of things, if you like, into the context of the people in the room here today and where you might be able um, to contribute. And if we look at those um, those three areas of safer aquatic environments, better prepared people and um, and partnerships. Um, I've had Andy just mock up a couple of examples um, with regards to each of those three categories, um, but it's really just to, to sort of get some thinking from you in 
um, how we might address those three areas within the strategy itself. So the, 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 what we need to know is, is effectively that, that research area. I might just go through the first one. Um, the, the other two at this stage, I think we'll just, you can take, take with you and have a read off later when you can put your thinking caps on and, and hopefully uh, pen to paper. But if, with regards to safer aquatic environments, what we know, people are twice as likely to drown in metropolitan areas, sorry, in regional areas than metropolitan areas. Um, you know, a bit of an oxymoron, but, you know, trained lifeguards and supervision is a, is a key um, prevention and pools are the safest place to, to recreate and learn to swim. What's the industry need to do? Undertake risk assessments to identify, analyse and evaluate appropriate mitigation actions. What governments need to do? Support assessment of public pools to inform public on safety standards and what communities need to do? Adhere to directions from management on safe public pool behaviour. So that's sort of uh, um, just a little bit of a summary there. A again, better prepared people. You know, there, there's things that we know about making sure people are better prepared. There's things that, that industry needs to do, what government needs to do and what community needs to do. And again, partnerships and collaboration. Um, you know, again, there's some good examples there. How, how do we time with health and fitness? Um, you know, willingness to work together in some areas, maybe not, not others so much. And again, what, what industry needs to do um, in, in forming those stronger partnerships, um, what governments needs to do, incentivise and support partnership programs, what community needs to do, better educate, better educate into the value of the industry um, and, and health. So they're, they're sort of, um, they're, they're the three things that we're really looking for in the engagement side of things rather than just be a, a talk fest by myself um, in, in regards to where you think your part of the industry, whether it be the learn to swim industry or the facility management side of things, where it might be able to contribute to, um, you know, what the industry needs to do. Um, if you're like me, you're very good at pointing the finger at the government and saying what the government needs to do. So we want you to actually have a have a crack at all all three of those things: um, the industry, government, and and the community. Um, the government often don't know what they need to do. And um, we also need to sort of, especially in the pools area, um, stipulate between um, local government and, and state government. So while this is a state government led strategy, um, you know, Municipals Association Victoria and local government Victoria uh, are going to be absolute key partners into um, taking that, this down to a local government, uh, local government level. So on that, and having no idea on how much time I've taken, I will um, I've sort of stuck my slides here. Um, are you able to just pull up my last slide? Just got my email address on it, um, where people can provide feedback or. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if there were questions in the chat or questions in the room. I'll, I'll, I'll chuck your email in the chat group. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just take some questions in the chat. Oh, sorry. Any questions, Ali? No, all good. Thank you very much. All right, guys, for those of you tuning in from home, we're just going to take a couple of minutes uh, whilst we rearrange the room um, and then we'll be with you shortly. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. So now we're going to hear from uh, RJ Houston, who's the National Aquatics Manager from Royal Life uh, National. Um, and then we're going to hear from, a, from our fellow colleagues at LSV as we, as we touch on uh, what drown water, swim safe, uh, emergency planning, facility champions, and I'll be presenting on water quality risk management planning. So over to you, RJ. Thank you. Hi everyone uh, listening at home and everyone here as well. Welcome. Um, how many people have we got on the line? Do we know or not sure? On the line, I said. Said the classic. I'll try and um, I'll try and uh, sort of click through this, and it seems to be working, which is great. Um, so Adrian sort of covered off your agenda there a little bit. Um, so I've been asked to uh, speak today a little bit around the guidelines for safe pool operations, um, particularly the supervision section, which is the uh, most um, most recent uh, section that's been released um, by Royal Life Saving Australia. And um, I thought I'd just give a little bit of background um, to the guidelines for safe pool operations um, to give a little bit of context to what they are and what they mean uh, for the aquatic industry, both in Victoria and nationally. Um, so in uh, 1991, the um, Royal Life Saving Australia Victoria branch published the first GSPO. So it's, uh, it's the 25 year anniversary this year, the 25th anniversary. Um, the guidelines were um, essentially put together by a small uh, task force or working group um, and authored by substantively one or two people. And it was, uh, it was sort of brought about as a result of um, uh, making a complex regulatory um, uh, environment, uh, which with a lot of overlaps, uh, more contextualized and specific to aquatic facilities. And um, it was initially targeted only at um, what we would call council or public uh, public owned public pools, um, although there was some scope for it to apply to those where members of the public would uh, attend an aquatic environment. Um, but essentially the, 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 the thrust behind the creation of the GSPO was to create an industry standard uh, which helped protect both the public um, from inappropriate practices, but more importantly for um, aquatic facility owners and operators is to protect the industry from inappropriate or unrealistic standards uh, being imposed upon the industry from a uh, regulatory perspective or in particular from overseas uh, common law decisions in the other commonwealth and common law jurisdictions uh, particularly probably the united states um, so this was a the, the concept was that a, an australian document could be created uh, which would govern uh, and set an industry standard that could be um, realistically uh, adhered to by the industry um, and the, the first sort of working group was made up of Royal Life Saving Society Australia Victoria branch, MAV, uh, an entity called a, uh, Aquatic Leisure, um, uh, ALI, Aquatic Leisure Institute, um, YMCA Victoria, and the Victorian Aquatic Industry Council, and an earlier version of what is now SRV. Um, <clears throat> so in the sort of the, the evolution of that is there was a, a number of iterations that moved up to become a national document. It was um, referenced in a number of coronial inquests and legal cases uh, domestically in Australia. And in 2015, uh, Royal Life Saving established what's called the uh, National Aquatic Industry Committee. So the concept was that the National Aquatic Industry Committee um, would then authorize and author the guidelines. It would become an industry document that's written by industry uh, for industry. So that's probably the key change about five, six years ago. and. Um, there was a uh, systematic uh, research process, a desktop review, uh, industry consultation, um, draft oh, was released yeah. in I'm draft. Not and yeah, some six months of consultation there. There was a, a second draft, um, and then there was eight months of consultation on that version. Um, in early 2018, the NAIC reviewed, um, which is the National Aquatic Industry Committee, sorry, reviewed every comment that was submitted by industry. Um, Life Saving Victoria facilitated forums and feedback uh, on those guidelines, um, a number of uh, local government entities, uh, Aquatic and Recreation Victoria, as well as a number of other entities nationally, um, provided extensive feedback on uh, this section, in particular the supervision section. Um, it was released in November 2018 and given a one year sort of grace period um, where facilities could care for the implementation of those guidelines, and it became effective as of the 1st of September 2019. Um, so I'll just cover off uh, essentially a summary of what's what's included 
uh, in the guideline. There's a, a significant change from being a, a very prescriptive guideline, uh, you must do this, you must do that, uh, to a more risk-based model. So um, you see a lot of shift in language from must to should. Um, and uh, again, it's a, moving to a sort of recommendations. These are some of the practices and systems and, um, and physical um, things that should be in place. Um, and that's and that would be sort of determined as best practice, but each operator should do their own risk assessment uh, and treat their own risks based on the likelihood and consequences of those risks and the inherent risks within their environment. Um, so uh, the 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 sort of structure of it is standards and expectations, setting some of the coronial um, recommendations. And there is a there's a better you know a 20 year history of coronial recommendations that 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 form a, a body of knowledge uh, in this space as to what does go wrong and, and how that happened. Um, and then this, uh, the, the NAIC and the GSPO steps in to uh, create uh, a response to those recommendations and a response to some of those challenges. Um, so it asks aquatic facility uh, operators to do a risk assessment. Um, and there's a there's the supervision section here, which looks at, um, it looks at things like uh, the planning, uh, the pool lifeguards, the users and the environment. There's another section as well, which is the um, swimming and water safety education and programs section, which um, also looks at some of the activities that are happening and a risk assessment for the activities. So you're looking at looking at the activities that are happening in the environment, the environment itself and the types of risks associated with that environment, things like glare and line of sight barriers. And then you're looking at the types of people that are entering that environment as well and what kind of pre-existing vulnerabilities do those people have in particular, um, in particular those with disabilities, pre-existing medical conditions, uh, older Australians, uh, young young people, as in under the age of sort of 12, in particular uh, toddlers under the age of five. Um, the most uh, common age to drown is when you uh, hit your first birthday. So there's a there's a significant um, component around types of vulnerabilities that users have. There's a fair amount of focus on the types of training and education that not just pool lifeguards should have, but also swimming and water safety teachers, uh, aquatic program instructors coordinators of those that deliver um, aquatic programs, as well as coordinators that look after lifeguards and teams of lifeguards and the types of training and responsibilities that they should have in terms of uh, training lifeguards, engaging with lifeguards, understanding risk and managing that risk as well. And in other sections of the GSPO, there's other components around emergency planning and the types of training that your planning committee should have and so on and so forth, incident investigation uh, and auditing. So um, there's, there's quite a bit in there. Um, and then key components again at the end is that is is once you've created your risk assessment, your plan, you've trained all your staff, you're now implementing your plan, is how do you know what success looks like? How do you know that you've achieved success? How do you know that your system works? Is it just luck? Is it just the fact that uh, every day we spin the we spin the wheel and play Russian roulette? Or uh, is your system very robust? Is there an evidence base? Has it been tested externally uh, and independently? Um, and using some sort of evidence-based process. So that's the sort of overview of the structure. Um, so I've talked a little bit around um, some of these sections, but this details which, um, which uh, sections fit under which sort of um, overall, if you, if you would call it a chapter. And then um, it talks a bit, yeah, having, having that supervision plan in place, the re requirements, the principles, um, the process of developing and writing that plan, and then the ongoing management of that. So if you're not sure, if you don't have one already, there is a, a significant amount of um, uh, instruction on how to do that within the within the guideline, and it's uh, in, in alignment with international standards for risk management. So um, it's sort of a, a robust um, guideline there as well. Uh, talking about pool lifeguards, the minimum requirements for training, induction, uh, in-service training, uh, ongoing re-accreditation, um, looking at their uh, health and fitness as well. Um, are they fit for duty? Are they able to do what we're asking them to do? Can they retrieve someone from the bottom of the dive pool? Um, can they do CPR for the amount of time it will take an ambulance to get to that facility, particularly in a sort of a rural or regional area and low patronage, that type of thing, um, where ambulance services might be far away. There's there's some significant guidance in that space as well. And then looking at their uniform and support and, and uh, in, in response to those coronial recommendations around identification of lifeguards and the fact that it's a, you know, a fairly identifiable profession and the public should have confidence in their role as frontline emergency service workers. 
Um, so talking about the plan as well, supporting a, a work plan that supports the plan. Have you resourced it? Have you got a budget that supports supervision? Have you got a uh, human resources type plan as to as to how supervision is resourced and reviewed and and um, and all of that? It's all in there. Stress testing as well. How well does your supervision plan actually work? How well do your staff actually implement what you've put on paper? There's lots of fantastic documents out there that look really beautiful and have gone to uh, graphic designers and so on and so forth. But does the end user, does the 17 or 16 or 18 year old lifeguard actually know how to interpret and apply that into a practical uh, deployment out, out on the pool deck that actually works? Um, and again, how do you sort of audit and monitor and review that plan? Um, so there's a few further references here. You can look at the um, drowning reports in Victoria. There's some, there's some uh, commentary around that and statistical analysis. If you go down into the sort of uh, research papers and coronial recommendations and some of the references, there's more information. Uh, the Safer Public Pools Code of Practice uh, has some summaries of the GSPO as well as some practical tips on how you can apply the GSPO and make compliance easier. Um, there's obviously other sections within the guidelines. Incident investigation is up, is up here on the on the screen. There's a, a you know a practical step-by-step -step how to investigate incidents uh, and what's involved in that. And then we've got the National Swimming and Water Safety Framework as well, which is a sort of national document on uh, standards in education of uh, swim teaching and programs. And then you've got the Victorian uh, safer, uh, sorry, state of sector report. So there's a few, um, there's a few further references there. In particular, last year, there was a significant, a significant sorry, a significant amount of non-fatal drownings in public pools. So that's uh, captured in both the drowning report and the state of sector report. And um, for every sort of non-fatal drowning, it's a, it's a very, very close call to a fatal drowning and often involves um, permanent disability as well. So there's still a lot of work to be done as an industry and as a sector, and, um, and it sort of starts with understanding um, where we've come from and, and where we need to get to. Thanks. Thank you, RJ. Um, my name's Lisa Gates and I'm a part of the pool safety team um, and I'm going to give you a snapshot of what's around water today. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Good start. Okay, so when it comes to watch around water, I'm preaching to a lot of the converted here, but I also am aware of, through looking at the chat and people in the room that there are some people that um, are not familiar with the program. Um, so some of the items that we're going to be reviewing today, uh, we're going to have a quick look at the objectives of the program, the current challenges, the role of management and also the role of staff. Um, the key objective, first of all, is to reduce the number of fatal and non-fatal drowning incidences and associated injuries and public aquatic facilities in Victoria within the 0 to 14 age group. Some further objectives are to raise the awareness of active supervision, challenges, increase the effective supervision of children at facilities, and also address in water and parental supervision levels. Some current challenges that we're all facing, um, over the last 12 months, we have all faced unprecedented challenges and we've all um, addressed them in a fantastic way, but it's also vital that we never lose sight of the mission of LifeSaving Victoria, which is to prevent aquatic related death and injury in all Victorian communities. And Watch Around Water is a focus for child supervision. We're going to look at the role of management, uh, the responsibilities that management and the leadership teams have at our facilities, and also the role of staff. Um, there can be a misconception from some key areas of staff that it's purely a lifeguard role, but for the key to the success of the Watch Around Water program, it's a responsibility of all staff within your centre. There are some key mandatory policies. Um, as a Watch Around Water endorsed facility, um, there are some mandatory policies that facilities must comply with. Um, first one being children under 10 years old must be accompanied into the centre by a responsible parent or guardian and must be constantly and actively supervised. The secondary, second mandatory policy is children under five years of age must be accompanied again into the centre by a responsible parent or guardian and must be constantly and actively supervised during recreational play within arm's reach. And finally, children over 10 years 
of age, parents must use their knowledge of the child's swimming ability and general development to determine the level of accompaniment required. The next case piece of information here is recommended. All centres have their own demographic and varying client needs, which is why these policies are recommended. Several centres have modified and developed policies to meet the needs of their facility or their council management um, requirements or where necessary can be addressed on an individual basis by their centre staff or management. So the recommended policies are a parent or guardian to two children under five years of age, a parent or guardian to four children under 10, and children under five years will not be admitted without a fee paying parent or guardian who's prepared to enter the water in line. And as reinforcing what I mentioned before, it's an all staff responsibility is that all staff and all management, regardless of their position or role, should complete watch around water training. Now we're just going to have a look at the key components of the actual program itself and Many of you will know this, but this is why we're just having a quick refresh of this information. Resources, first of all, um, there's a Watch Around Water member resource area or portal that as an endorsed facility, you have access to all the resources. Something I'd like you to think about is, when was the last time you referred to this portal? Did you locate what you were looking for? Were you aware of all the information that's also available in that portal? And Ask yourself, and I'd really ask you to take the time to allocate yourself time to return to that area because there's a wealth of information in there. A part of the information in there is the management training. Um, there's a staff and management manual that has invaluable information. It details how the program evolved, the role of your facility, the role of the parent and guardian, challenges faced by us, both staff and parents at all the facilities, and how to successfully implement the program at your facility. Staff training. A key component to this part of the Watch Around Water program is that engage key staff at your facility who are already invested in the messaging and the supervision model that, it's, um, that we're proposing, um, such as the people that have that key message and are passionate about it, upskill them, support existing staff. They can support existing staff and they can also help be actively involved in training of new staff. To help do this, again, the resources, there's a Watch Around Water training PowerPoint that you have access to deliver to your teams. So it's there ready for you. Um, there's also an online learning module for all staff. So once they complete that online learning module, they have a certificate of completion that can then get sent to their team leader for, and that's on their file that they have undertaken that learning. And there's also, and the key information here with that model, that online learning module is available for everyone. Your gym staff, your aquatic education staff, your frontline staff, they all play such an important part. It's not just for the lifeguards. So it's important everyone is engaged in that staff training. And then reinforcing what RJ just mentioned a moment ago about the supervision and the risk assessment. It's vital that we have a documented risk assessment for the supervision facility, um, for the various program, for the time of day, and for everything else that's going on. And that has to meet the needs of your facility. So that's reinforcing you need that risk assessment um, documented and the information from before. How do we test that information as well? which was mentioned as mystery guest visits. Um, Lifestand Victoria, we can provide mystery guest visits to facilities. A lot of facilities are aware of this, but it's also an area that can be invaluable. You can engage us once or twice a year to have a snapshot of how is your deployment plan working? How is your supervision plan working? You're 17, 18, on the weekend, how are your staff performing? Following a visit, from a representative, um, an Alice Lee representative will uh, attend the centre as a patron and you will receive a detailed report of what was observed against a set of criteria. The report will highlight the wins. We're not just looking for those areas where there's problems. We will highlight the wins and also identify areas where improvement needs to be considered. 
once again, everything in for Watch Around Water is GSP al GSPO alignment. So supervision, aquatic supervision, details the supervision requirements for facilities and patrons, and the Watch Around Water program meets all of those requirements. Um, and also the requirements in the MGVs are tailored against the criteria of the GSPO. So you'll be getting a detailed report and it's all GSPO and industry best practice referencing. The next thing is to review. Once again, we need to review the information. Lifesaving Victoria continue to review the Watch Around Water program and the resources which are available to industry. It's vital that facilities also review their own performance. You may be an endorsed facility and you may have had the program in there for three years, four years, whatever it may be, but you need to keep up to date with the resources that we have available, such as the e-learning and the online training that we have, they've been introduced over the last 12 to 18 months. And that's just a huge weight off your shoulders. Here, here's the training, it's in a package for you and your staff teams. So, and you can also do an annual self-assessment. And what you'll be doing is you'll be objectively looking at how are you performing, what's going well, and what areas there are for improvement. These self-assessments are all in that staff and management manual. And the key for the program as well, it's out of the out, out the box, what you get being a part of the Watch Around Water program. So when you engage with the program, all the necessary support resources are available to you. It's been developed by industry who have an understanding of your needs and your challenges. It provides training resources to management, to staff, parents and guardians. You receive a suite of display resources and marketing resources. And once again, my key is that it meets all the GSPO requirements. And coming into our last one is this is how it can be implemented at your facility. Um, the display materials can be strategically placed at your facility at key locations to, to ensure that there's layers of messaging reach all our patrons, no matter where they are in your facility. And one of the um, advantages I have in this role is I've been able to visit many facilities over the last 12 months and see fantastic examples of how facilities are committed to it and they put this key information um, and they're invested in it so that it um, reaches all their clients. So entry, you have your endorsement sticker. You can have a, at the facility entry, you can have um, pull up banners and watch around with Im images on walls. I mean, what an example this one is here. We then go to reception and the frontline staff. Um, we've got our second layer of information coming through. At the reception area, facility, facility staff engage with those customers. They have conversations. They can be ready with the wristbands and that can be supported by brochures and lifeguard cards and also digital and TV messaging at those frontline areas. Child parent areas, splash pads, um, lots of great examples at many, many facilities. Um, at entry to aquatic areas, along the rise of steps as well. Um, reception counters, I've seen fantastic examples as you walk into reception. Um, tipping buckets as we've got here, um, the cards as well. So there's just so many examples across the industry where there's, um, they really support and are committed to the um, Watch Around Water program handover at swimming lessons. This is another really important part is where it's a key staff responsibility. Um, aquatic education team can be reinforcing the watch around water messaging, um, reinforcing the mandatory policies. Are the children wearing wristbands um, if they're going to have casual play before or after? Um, is the child being handed over to a parent depending on the age of the child and the swimming lesson that they're actually in? Um, or also there are fantastic audio announcements and PA announcements that can also be put out at regular intervals through key periods such as swimming lessons and weekends and peak times. So there's lots of resources for you. Um, change areas as well. We've got examples here that we have resources in multiple languages also. Change rooms are a given. It's communal change areas to have some sort of signage there and also in the play and cafe areas. Um, once again, you have your digital and your TV messaging. You can have camp stands as well. Um, so on just summary, I'm finishing up here, is I'd just like to reinforce the messaging, which is um, 
The objective of the Watch Around Water program is to reduce fatal and non-fatal drowning incidences in public aquatic facilities in young children in the 0 to 14 years age group. There are key mandatory policies um, as a part if you are invested in the program that they must be followed. Management has a key responsibility that you're not only an endorsed facility, but you're committed to ensure that the program and the key messaging is being delivered successfully at your facility and you get your staff on board. And a key thing right now is with so many staff changes over the last 12 months and everything we've been through, do those key team leaders, do they know the Watch Around Water login? Do they know what's in the resource portal, uh, in the member resource portal, in the staff and management manual? So this is a time to really get them on board and engage them. And then also the LSV support resources. It's important that all those resources, we touch base with them, just like you do an annual review of your risk assessments and so forth. Jump into these areas, review, refresh your knowledge, Share your ideas with the industry. I know there's a lot of images we've seen there of some great facilities and that we're very proud of what we see. But instead of us all reinventing the wheel, let's share our information. And it's fantastic to see so many facilities um, that are committed, committed and have great ways and are innovative in, in um, getting that messaging out to the um, wider industry. And on finishing, currently we have over 200 endorsed facilities in the Watch Around Water program. We're going to continue to spread this message because we want that number to grow. Um, and I'd like to congratulate, congratulate you all on your ongoing support and keep up the good work with the Watch Our Water Program. Thank you, Lisa. Um, my name's Andy. I'm one of the team down here at um, LifeSave in Victoria. Um, I'm not as eloquent as Lisa. Um, I'm not as prepared either, um, but we'll see how we um, we'll see how we go. Um, this is the final section um, to to wrap up the first half um, of today, where we're essentially um, trying to re-engage everybody um, on on supervision. And the intent is not to say you need to sign up or register these programs. The intent is actually to tie back to the, um, the first presentation from RJ and say that when you're writing those risk assessments, when you're writing those supervision plans, when you are inducting and training your staff, when you're doing that stress testing, there are certain user groups that need additional attention. Um, and that's a, that's a requirement. Um, so we've talked about the, um, the young children's group and we're very, very proud um, and we should all sort of take a moment to, to touch wood that there have been zero fatal drowning incidences um, in any accredited um, water and water facilities um, going back to the inception of the program over 10 years ago. Um, a more recent challenge um, that's, that, that's probably one that we've taken on um, that's probably more complex uh, in its nature um, is, is how we look after vulnerable adults that come and visit our facilities. So we have 70 million visits to our council owned um, public pools in a non COVID year. Um, so as a result, we're as high risk as any aquatic environment in the state to have um, a drowning. And I think it's a testament to all of you and, and to the people that have sort of come before you that were able to talk about those numbers. Um, now, that's a wonderful thing for us. But tying back to Paul's presentation at the very beginning, it obviously makes it very difficult for us to get to the top of the agenda from a government perspective because they foresee that there is actually not a problem there. People are coming to our facilities, they're safe, they're learning to swim, they're having fun, they're being healthy, they're going home. Um, so we have to be very, very mindful um, that we continue to sensibly push all of the messages associated with water safety, which is why now is the time, and I'd encourage everybody here to scribble your thoughts onto the, um, the document on your page, because we need to get these ideas, these suggestions and the feedback on the challenges and the pieces of work that we need to do as an industry to government as part of the Victorian water safety strategy rather than find ourselves behind behind the um, behind the proverbial eight ball. Um, so swim safe is a program that targets vulnerable swimmers um, by vulnerable swimmers. We're talking about people from a multicultural background. We're talking about people with pre-existing medical conditions and we're talking about older adults. Um, we're also talking about non or weak swimmers who may or may not be in one of those previous categories. Um, as well. Um, if we look at it from a background perspective, um, whilst we haven't had a, a public pool drowning for, for a long, long time, 
Um, now I think we're into year six or seven, which again is an incredible testament um, to the work the industry does. When we started looking at this piece of work and going, well, what are we going to do? Like, what's the plan? People are coming into the facilities and they're not going home. At that time, we were having um, one um, public pool fatal drowning incident um, per annum, and we were having 20 to 25 non-fatal drowning incidences as well. Um, our responses are very, very good. We have brought many, many people back from the brink. Um, regrettably, as, as RJ alluded to earlier, we are still having a high number of non-fatal incidences, um, which is something that we need to continue to, to consider. Um, and one of the, the statistics um, that's not very pleasing is that of those people um, involved in both fatal and non-fatal incidences, 30% of them um, were born overseas. So there was a clear challenge um, that, that needed to be addressed. There have been things that have been tried um, in the past, but there've never really been a holistic approach um, to this whole, this whole challenge. Um, it was given a kick up the backside um, in 2014-15 um, when the coroner came out after a fatal drowning incident at a, at a Victorian, at a Melbourne um, council pool. Um, and, and two of the findings um, in particular were targeted, um, were targeted at the industry in terms of what we needed to do better. Um, the first one, as you can see up there, was to implement, uh, this was aimed at the facility, the particular facility involved, um, but it's obviously something um, that has broader reach. Um, so the requirement was to implement a system encouraging patrons to inform a staff member of their vulnerability before entering the water. Okay, so not an easy one to, to take on necessarily and not information that people as standard would offer as they entered uh, one of our facilities. Um, and the second one was to explore the options and means for best communicating with patrons who have English language challenges um, or English as a second language to inform staff of their vulnerabilities before entering the water. Again, not something that stereotypically users um, from sort of non-Australian backgrounds would offer. This, this was a piece of work that we knew we couldn't do by ourselves in Live Southern Victoria, so we actually outsourced two components of the, the program um, and of the research. We outsourced the research development component um, to a specialist organisation. Um, we sat across the project um, and then we also outsourced the actual development of the marketing materials um, to a separate organisation, again, knowing that it wasn't, um, it wasn't a piece of work um, that we could do. So the research, the whole project ran across multiple years. Um, it took a while to get there. The first attempt of the resources um, failed miserably uh, in simple terms. Um, but before we could even develop those, res those resources, we actually had to go and talk to these vulnerable user groups. Um, and again, they're not always the easiest to get in contact with. They're not necessarily the easiest to communicate with. Um, and that is obviously part of the challenge that we that we had to overcome. So we spoke to, um, there was a range of in-depth interviews con conducted at, at facilities, including facilities, you may or may not know it, but a number of you representing um, those facilities. Um, there was a lot of field work that was undertaken um, there was um, a range of targeted focus user group uh, interviews as well. Um, and we there was a few little bits of information up there as to how we try to engage with those those groups and reward them for their, their time in informing what it was we thought that we had to do. Um, so we went round the grounds twice. We, we came up with a suite of, of resources. Um, they didn't really land. They didn't make sense. They didn't get the messaging across. Um, they were um, they were essentially where we landed in the second instance, but they had human human pictures, which um, which raised the issue of fear in the um, with the actual audience that we were trying to engage with, and that was obviously the opposite of, of what we were trying to do. We want to continue to encourage people to come to our facilities to learn swimming and water safety and to have a good time and to live healthier lives. So where we landed were were these resources and these, um, these five key messages. It's very, very straightforward stuff. Um, it's obvious to us who have had the, the fortune of, of growing up uh, in areas where swimming and water safety was probably something that our sort of parents um, would have gotten us into at a relatively young age. Um, you know, obviously, again, living relatively close to the beach, it's something that's just a part of life. But that's not the case for, for everyone. Um, and as more and more facilities go, grow, and as the growth suburbs get these huge facilities as well, there are um, there are a range of challenges inherently that come um, that come with that. So, 
there was a range of materials put together. There were banners and posters and leaflets and all those sorts of things. Um, and we knew from the get go that it was going to land in a similar spot to where Watch Around Water lands. There would need to be training element. There'd need to be an online learning element. There'd need to be easy access to resources. The resources would need to be you'd have to be able to take them out of the box and stick them on reception. Alternatively, they needed to be editable versions that people could blow up, make bigger, add their own logos, all those sorts of things. So we had an idea um, of where this was going to land, but we didn't have an idea of exactly what those messages needed to be. So again, we had to outsource um, that piece of work. And we went round to the grounds, as I mentioned, um, with two design concepts until we, we got to this um, and we delivered um, a range of trial courses. We had some placebo facilities and we had some trial courses with all of the new materials in. So we know that this is a research proven um, program. The, exa the executive summary of what the staff said um, by having lanyards around their neck at reception, by having something that that actually encouraged that that conversation and by having materials that people could you know read in a, a range of different areas at their convenience but certainly before they got into the water um, the staff essentially said that it made it easier to communicate you don't want to without some form of logical prompt you don't just want to ask someone if they're a non-swimmer it will just come across as as rude or inappropriate or somewhere in between um, they said it helped to prompt that initial discussion um, at reception and that people actually were forthcoming with their understanding of whether they were a non or weak swimmer, although the accuracy of what they considered a non or weak swimmer to be is probably somewhat different to what you and I may consider a strong or weak swimmer to be. The pictures obviously kept the whole thing um, very, very simple and it addressed that language barrier. That's not to say that moving forward, we don't need these resources in a whole suite of other languages, um, but as a first cut, the pictures um, set us up for a level of success and very, very similar to what Lisa mentioned. This has to be an all of staff initiative. If nothing happens and then the poor old lifeguard is, is stuck on pool deck, they're essentially already again behind the eight ball and they've got to pick up the pieces for what other staff haven't done. Whether that's the managers not having done the risk assessment, the managers not having done the self assessment of the facility, the managers not having resources um, like this or similar, um, in in readily visible places um, or whether it's the the customer service team um, or whoever else uh, is there um, not doing this piece of work so it really has to be an all of staff team and it really has to be the type of thing that similar to to watch around water or whatever your program may be called has to sit on your agendas on an ongoing basis similar to Watch around water, there was no point in doing something if it didn't talk to the GSPO. So this program was being developed at the time that the, the sort of the big piece of the GSPO, the supervision section was getting reviewed. So we had the opportunity to tie it in um, as closely as possible. But you'll see there, there's six specific um, sections um, where it ties into very, very directly. And there's probably another half a dozen or so where, where, where there's arguably an indirect link as well. So this certainly makes life very, very easy um, for you. Um, it certainly acts to, to demonstrate your, your duty of care, your due diligence towards this user group. And I think if you were talking to WorkSafe, they would probably say that without some form of program um, targeted towards these vulnerable swimmers, there's an argument there that you're not demonstrating your duty of care. So again, whether it's SwimSafe, whether it's Water and Water, or whether you've got a localised program, this is the sort of thing that you need to have, a multifaceted approach. It's the leaflets, it's the brochures, it's the, it's the lanyards, it's the PA announcements, it's all of those things tied together that reduce the big holes in those lumps of cheese um, that we don't want to line up before that incident. If we don't catch them with the poster, we might get them at the reception. If we don't get them at reception, we might get them in the change room. If we don't get them in the change room, we might get them with a lifeguard card. It's all of those sorts of things. If we get them two or three times in the journey, it actually might they actually might remember it for next time they come back. We launched it at an absolutely terrible time, um, just ahead sort of 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 COVID. So it is what it is, and this is almost sort of a sort of semi formal um, semi formal sort of relaunch um, of the program. We'd love to see more people, um, more facilities um, partnering with the program and we'll continue to support facilities um, as we develop those resources, as we develop the training materials, um, whether it is again for this program or, or a program of, of your choosing, um, because we're, we're very, very passionate about making sure that we don't have that next incident. It is one day closer than it was yesterday. It is inevitable. 
Unfortunately, if you consider that exposure risk, we face those 70 million visits um, per day. Um, it is worst case scenario from a, a life saving Victoria perspective and a almost worst worst case scenario from a facility perspective other than a multiple um, a multiple fatality incident. Um, and it's something that, again, we need to make sure remains on the agenda um, as best as possible. So I'll just ask if there's any questions um, for any of those first three presentations that we gave, whether they were um, from RJ and, and his supervis supervision presentation from Lisa on the Water and Water presentation, or the quick snapshot rundown of, of where we got to where we are from a perspective. Adrian, how are we looking? All good? All right, thank you very much. Good morning, my name's Alec Olszewski and I'm manager here at Lifesaving Victoria in the pool safety area. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about emergency planning uh, and its requirement uh, in and around aquatic facilities specifically. Uh, so let me just uh, go through the agenda of what I'll cover here today. First of all, just a bit of an overview from the standard and from the GSPO itself. Um, and then we'll get into emergency readiness and testing, adaptation, recovery, um, and just a little bit at the end on mass gatherings um, and planning for emergency management for your events. Um, first of all, uh, the GSPO is, is fairly clear on, on emergency planning. Um, there is a whole section um, for uh, emergency planning broken down into four sections, uh, but uh, emergency, uh, according to the GSPO, is an event um, that causes or threatens to cause death or injury or other damage to the health and, uh, of any person or destruction or damage to any property or a disruption to services or services usually enjoyed by the community or um, even harm to the environment or to flora and fauna. So within that sort of uh, uh, definition, if you like, there's a fairly broad uh, requirement and there is an a requirement for facilities uh, to plan for emergencies. Um, the Australian standard here is uh, the Australian standard 3745, which is planning for emergencies in facilities. These are the two documents that are really uh, important uh, for facilities to get their head around and to, to get an understanding of when they're, um, when they're making an emergency plan. Um, so just really quickly on the slide here, um, that uh, uh, Australian standard will help you in, in what's uh, putting together your EPC. Your EPC is your emergency planning committee. Um, so the, the requirement there is that uh, management employees uh, and uh, groups or stakeholders within a facility need to come together to, to plan for emergencies. Um, in turn, there is a, a requirement for the EPC to inform uh, what is called an emergency control organisation. And these are effectively the group of people that are going to come together to manage an emergency within the facility. The standard gives guidance on the size of the emergency control organisation. Um, it also details the education and training requirements for the emergency planning committee and the ECO. And I'm not going to get too much into those details today. Um, it is important, however, to plan uh, your emergency procedures, prepare for all emergencies that are likely to occur in your facility and to practice your response to them, uh, to those. Uh, so um, the, the key items here, scoping and defining uh, what your emergency uh, risks are in your facility, um, and this should be done through, through a risk-based process. Um, in turn, that would then um, inform your work plan, the training, um, the emergency types and levels that are, are being uh, that could occur in your facility, um, and in turn, emergency management plan testing, introduction of colour codes and alarms and warnings. These are all covered in the in the documents. Um, out of the box, the standards provide you with the with the core principles uh, for emergency planning. Uh, some key ones that are going to occur in all of our facilities, and that you uh, need to prepare for, um, obviously drowning, lost children, medical emergencies, 
Um, threats common to all workplaces like fire, armed robbery, weather um, or extreme weather and geological events, or things like utility disruption. Um, but also consider uncommon events, um, however uncommon uh, they may have uh, an influence on your facility down, down the track. And in the modern context, it's, uh, it's therefore important to think about terrorism, hostage situations um, and, and other extreme situations like that, but also uh, to plan for and, and, uh, and prepare for your evacuation procedure, which in itself is an emergency of sorts. Um, you should uh, you can take a risk-based approach here uh, and the risk-based approach um, th there's many out there one of the the key ones that I use and have used in the past is the five whys uh, risk-based approach the uh, the five whys is is a process by which you identify a, a potential risk and you ask why uh, five times uh, with the eventual goal of getting to a countermeasure or prevention procedure so um, we can always uh, ask for help and, and validate. Uh, Lifesaving Victoria uh, provides now a service for emergency management planning, but there are many um, services out there. So if you and uh, your facility uh, colleagues are unsure, it's always um, it's always good to, to seek help uh, for emergency planning. But it's also um, an opportunity to be creative. If the standard model doesn't fit your own uh, facility, it's important to um, to think outside the box um, and to uh, to put together a system that works for you. Um, but always refer back to this risk-based approach in in the planning um, in the in the planning of your emergency plan. So it's important to focus on prevention. Um, and to keep it simple, to make sure that your uh, your facility uh, responders are able to easily and adequately um, carry out the plan when it comes to it. Um, emergency readiness. I wanted to um, talk really quickly on the uh, importance of testing your emergency plan, um, and the testing and, and training should actually be outlined in your emergency plan as it. As it um, as it stands. The training resources um, and time should be allocated and budgeted for as part of your plan. Um, and members of management should ensure that the emergency planning committee and the ACO are resourced to complete the training. It's, it's all very well to have uh, these things in your plan, but if you can't uh, adequately uh, do this due to funding resources, then um, your whole plan can go out the window. Induction and training processes for all staff are extremely important. Um, and it's important to note that procedures, particularly around emergency management plans, should be individual to the facility and therefore it is important to induct and train everybody in each facility that they're coming into. However, the core uh, elements of your emergency management um, plans should remain the same. And on the screen here, we've got some, uh, some key, uh, I guess, um, signposted uh, reference points um, that MSAC, this is Melbourne Sports and Aquatic Centre, have, have put into their plan. So they've got a, a plan about, or they've got a procedure about how to deal with the media in an emergency procedure. That um, uh, that sort of snake wiggle uh, procedure on 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 the far side there is is their basic uh, emergency response steps, which identify, speak up, uh, prepare, act and reassess, which is a really easy message for anybody that's in a high pressure, in a high pressure situation um, to follow. Uh, the, the next one uh, there is a, is a communications procedure, um, who to get in, in touch with, with what type of emergency, and there's just really simply six different types of emergencies on, on this screen. Um, and then uh, in the bottom left here, we have uh, a standard uh, uh, evacuation diagram. Uh, most facilities will have these. Um, it is important to note uh, they expire every five years, so it's important to keep them up to date uh, and your fire safety uh, team or, or you can have somebody external come in and, and they will develop these in, in a compliant way for you. Uh, yeah, I've already covered that. The other thing I wanted to talk to in relation to emergency readiness um, is, is the idea of things changing. Uh, Recently, I uh, was in the uh, in the position to be debriefing a team uh, at 
uh, at a facility that I used to work at um, following an incident where a rescue had occurred. Um, and, and one of the things um, that was interested is that there were there were two lifeguards in the water responding to a, a patient that had um, started a race uh, and got very quickly into trouble. And uh, and those two lifeguards in the water were swimming um, the, the patient to the edge. The third responder in this situation um, can be actively seen on, on, um, on CCTV, continuing to supervise the pool. Um, and one of the questions um, that, that we put to that, uh, or that I was able to um, debrief with that responder was, hang on a minute, why was it that you um, continue to supervise the pool rather than referring back to our standard emergency procedure, which is um, person three goes in and grabs equipment um, uh, and, and focuses on the big picture. Um, and the response is, well, things changed. I was um, in that circumstance, uh, uh, still required to continue to supervise the pools. So I couldn't drop everything. I had to let other things play out first uh, before before moving to uh, the standard uh, emergency management procedure in, in that situation. So emergency management Victoria have a joint standard operating procedure, which is called dynamic risk assessing. It essentially breaks down into, into this slide. Um, and in a in a lifeguarding situation, we can also uh, we can also use this type of slide. Um, but essentially, what it says is evaluate the situation, select a standard operating procedure, assess that standard operating procedure for its relevance to your current circumstance, and before you act, ensure that you're not creating more problems. If you're going to create more problems by acting upon that um, acting upon that process. Uh, you've got this uh, stop, go back to the start, find another procedure, find something else that we can do to make this um, safe, safer before we move on. Um, and in my experience at facilities, it's really important uh, to ensure that uh, your emergency responders have this mindset that it's not all about following the procedure to the absolute letter of the law. It's about being able to adapt the procedure to the most relevant procedure that you've uh, that you can for that circumstance, which is why it's important to run drills, why it's important to run um, training, why it's important um, to learn from, from each uh, training situation as it goes on. Post-incident, we, we head into a recovery phase. Um, and it's important um, for everybody to review and learn, debrief and report, um, before we return to operations. And you can actually run this slide in, in either direction. Post-incident, there's an there's a, a important um, piece to be done in debriefing those that were involved in an incident. Right? And part of your emergency management plan should include a plan to how to debrief or involve uh, getting somebody in that's formally trained in debriefing. Uh, every emergency, uh, every emergency has an opportunity for review and learnings. Um, and these re uh, review and learnings are just as important for the team that um, completed the emergency as for the emergency planning committee. So post-incident, the emergency planning committee needs to come together. They need to understand what went wrong what, ro and what went right in the, um, in the incident and plan to um, prevent future emergencies um, or introduce procedures um, back into the operating model uh, that help mitigate some of the circumstances that um, that occur in any emergency. Um, I think we've already covered this slide. Looks like it's there again. So apologies. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk to, and finally, I wanted to talk to events and mass gather mass gatherings. Um, so it's all very well to have an emergency plan in place. Uh, and it's day in, day out, uh, the plan that uh, that will help operate your facility. This is this is MSAC and um, or Melbourne Sports and Aquatic Centre, and we borrowed um, some of their slides here today. But on any particular day in in M MSAC, you could have three or four events running. And in this circumstance, um, on, on this um, type of slide, we're pretending that we've got a school sports. Um, state event over at uh, track and field, which is a, across the way. There is a national swimming event in, in, in the main pool hall. 
um, and over on one of their stadium, we've got a, a Jiu Jitsu event. So in that circumstance, uh, it's really important to uh, understand the event before it happens um, and even put together an emergency plan for each event. Uh, again, I'll refer back to the incident where uh, where the lifeguard was in the water recently at the at the pool that I was working at. Um, it was a school carnival, uh, and due to uh, uh, due to it being a school carnival, there had been additional lifeguards put in place that would not have otherwise been there. The um, I guess the importance um, of planning for maths gatherings and planning for events. Is, is underpinned by um, there's, a, there's a recent incident uh, in Victoria where and uh, where a, a particular facility was running a um, a, a come and meet us learn to swim event um, and the the facility itself um, uh, Due to no fault of, um, maybe due to fault of their own, has um, has not adequately planned for the event necessarily. Um, so in that type of circumstance, uh, lifeguards are going to be distracted by by other things that are going on. There's not a, a, a usual sort of uh, standard operating procedure in place, and in that circumstance, things can go wrong. So it's it's always important to um, plan for mass gatherings and events. So, Thank you, Alec. Uh, for those of you who have tuned in online, uh, can appreciate that we have gone over time, uh, but if you can bear with us and stay tuned for the next two uh, presentations, then that would be great. Uh, for those of you that are here, probably should have mentioned at the beginning, if you haven't scanned in with the QR code, please do so during the lunch break. That would be really appreciated. All right, let's get into water quality risk management plan. So a bit of an overview for the session today. Um, so we're gonna talk about what the uh, water quality guidelines are uh, the regulations of aquatic facilities, uh, the required information for your risk management plans, and some key messages. So uh, let's let's begin. So uh, in December 2020, the water quality guidelines for public facilities were published. Uh, as such, there were key compliance requirements to be met under the Act and under, under the regulations. So as aquatic facilities are covered by these regulations, aquatic facilities must follow the water quality guidelines. These guidelines replaced the pool operator's handbook and was developed in conjunction with Queensland Health. They provide practical operational guidance for maintaining water quality and facilities should consider having these readily available alongside their water quality risk management plans. So if that's at your desk, if that's at the duty manager station, uh, lifeguard station, whoever is tasked with uh, actioning and addressing any pool closures as an example, uh, something to think about there. Public aquatic facilities are important for maintaining and promoting active lifestyles and providing health benefits. However, if aquatic facilities are not properly managed, the risk of bathers may be put at risk. Show of hands, who would be keen to swim in that pool? Not for those of you tuning in online, nobody put their hand up. Bathers can be affected by disease causing microorganisms that are passing through contaminated pool water, contaminated services, or person-to-person -person contact. This is particularly relevant for vulnerable groups in our community, such as young children, the elderly, and people with low immunity. So what I've included here is uh, a bit of a table uh, just outlining what uh, categories your pools could fall under. So notably, uh, for those of you who are in the audience uh, online, uh, there's, a, there's a mix from uh, you know council aquatic facilities and learn to swim facilities. Uh, and having a look around the room here, uh, there's a bit of a mix there. Josh, I know you're from a camp. Um, and then we've got predominantly council owned facilities around here as well. So uh, something to think about there. Um, so what does it mean to, to an owner and operator of, owner of a facility? Uh, all category one and category two aquatic facilities must have a water quality risk management plan in place to help minimise potential public health risks. Barry, do you do uh, pool tests yourself? I used to. Yep, cool. I'd be I'd be asking the uh, the bosses to view their 
water quality risk management plan, I reckon. All right, so here we've got uh, the required information. Um, so the guidelines state that a water quality risk management plan must include these elements. So staff operating an aquatic facility should be trained appropriately for their role. And as a minimum standard, aquatic facility operators must complete a short course offered by an industry body or an RTO, so registered training organisation there. All aquatic facilities must have filtration combined with primary disinfection, and that's either chlorine or bromine. There's a recommendation for secondary disinfection, such as, such as UV, to be installed. This is particularly for high-risk facilities where there is a need for extra protection against cryptosporidium. So there isn't an expectation that every aquatic facility in Victoria has a UV system installed. Um, however, for the new facilities or retrofitting of existing facilities, these guidelines should be followed as clearly as possible. The plan should act as a guidance on how to optimise filtration, disinfection and reduce dis disinfection byproducts. So when conducting your hazard ID or, or your risk assessment, consider microbiological hazards, environmental hazards and your chemical hazards. Here we have a, um, a table which outlines a low, low to medium risk facilities and high risk facilities. So there's a, there's a bit of confusion out there, and I've visited a few facilities over the last couple of months around operational and verification monitoring. So in layman's terms, think about pool water testing versus microbiological water testing. So the frequency of monitoring is determined by the risk profiles as set out in this table that you'll see on your screen. High, high risk facilities should be tested monthly for microbiological water testing and low to medium risk facilities should be tested quarterly. Automated operational monitoring is recommended, particularly for high risk facilities. However, daily checks are still required to, ver to verify these tests. Some key messages. DHS has developed resources to assist aquatic facilities to prepare for their water quality risk management plan. Aquatic facilities can use their own water quality risk management plan template if they wish, provided that it addresses all the mandatory elements that I've just touched on. All public aquatic facilities must have a water quality risk management plan. A water quality risk management plan describes how an aquatic facility will protect public health by managing water quality risks. A water quality risk management plan is also required for the registration of all category one aquatic facilities with local, local council. So this should have occurred uh, prior to December 14, 2020. The responsibility to maintain and review these plans is with the aquatic facility. There's no requirement for council to approve these plans. However, it is at the discretion of your council how they want to use them. Further information on the water quality guidelines and the development of a water quality risk management plan can be found at the DHS website. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so this is the last section for today, and it'll only take um, a couple of minutes because the message is, is relatively clear. But essentially, we wanted to cover this very quickly um, because we acknowledge that there is a um, there's we've obviously lost a lot of very good people uh, in the last um, 12 months who, who have gone to other industries and won't be coming back. Um, but also to acknowledge that inherently we have a transient industry. Um, so making sure that the training standards are up to speed is something that we have to continue to push um, and it's something that we'll continue to push from a life saving Victoria perspective because we believe very, very firmly that it underpins everything else that we do at those facilities. So we just want to talk about very briefly the Facility Champions program um, that we offer that we believe will make in-service training very, very easy at your facility um, and also very, very um, straightforward to um, deliver. Um, but before we do, we just need to cover off on the the actual requirements for facilities. And this is essentially um, a summary straight out of the GSPO. So for those working at seasonal facilities, the requirement is to do um, training um, across the items listed in the GSPO pre-season um, and then sessions every three months thereafter, depending on the length of the season. Um, for all year facilities, obviously the requirement, as we know, is to undertake quarterly training. Um, ideally, that training should be on site there are some exceptions for generic elements such as CPR um, and then obviously there is a requirement to um, cover all of the content detailed in the GSPO, cover all the content detailed in your own operational documents and just make sure that the record keeping um, is, um, is covered. 
LSV do offer a quarterly in-service training package, and we also offer a two-pack for seasonal facilities, but we actually don't want to deliver that training to your facilities. We think you're much better off to deliver it yourself. Um, we think you're better placed to contextualize it to your facility, to contextualize it to the, race, um, the, the risks that you face, and to contextualize it to the staff in your facility. Um, but we, we, we've developed this over time, um, and it is there as, as an offering, but like I say, it's not something that we actually um, want to, we actually want to be delivering um, at your at your facilities. We split the session, uh, each of the sessions into four, so that the, essentially the first half is, is dry um, and you're doing some, a theory component, then you do a first day component, then you'll hop in the pool and do some form of practical element and then some form of examination to make sure we cover off everything in the GSPO and pretty much everything in your first aid um, a, as well. What we want to do is partner with you guys to deliver this training. So essentially we would endorse you and individuals at your facility to deliver this training in partnership with Lifesaving Victoria. Okay, so it will be your facility, your staff, your venue, your equipment, but it would use our resources. And that way you know that it's meeting the, the requirements that are set out in the GSPO. And all I want to quickly go through um, is what the prerequisites are to be able to kickstart this sort of thing and then also the other opportunities that you may find you have uh, in particular in and around school and holiday programs. So essentially how the program works is that you would partner with LifeSaving Victoria, you essentially become a service member at LifeSaving Victoria which is currently free um, and you deliver the training um, essentially under our, under our umbrella or in partnership with us. Um, there's two types of prerequisites, the first one is the bullet point list and that's, that's essentially some form of induction um, for you as a trainer. Okay, so you may have a VIT registration, which is for, for teachers. Um, um, you may have a bachelor, you may have a diploma, um, you may have a Cert for training and assessment. You can undertake an LSV train the trainer certificate, which is just where we would send out a trainer maybe to the four pools in Burundara and we would bring certain people from each of those facilities up to speed. We might send out a trainer to train up staff representing the six facilities in Geelong, for example. Um, you may have the SLSA training officer certificate already, um, or you may have the teacher of swimming and water safety. So the swim teacher qualification, which inherently has taught you how to teach already. What you then need is um, some form of, of skill or knowledge or, or prerequisite associated with what you're delivering. So using the pool lifeguard example, um, essentially if you want to deliver um, the pool lifeguard in service training, Essentially, you have to hold a pool lifeguard and a first aid certificate, which you already would. Um, if we have an equivalent um, package that we offer for swim teachers, and again, the requirement is that you hold the teacher of swimming and water safety and CPR, um, as well as one of those teaching prerequisites. Um, we then have, um, again, the offer, the opportunity for you to deliver your own watch around water uh, training or your own swim safe training. And again, the entry requirements are relatively straightforward. You need to be a pool lifeguard or you need to be um, a swim teacher. Again, holding one of those um, teaching prerequisites across the top. This is a really good way to identify some of the key people in your staff and provide them with a pathway, rather than just create, turn them into a duty manager or, or leave them at a duty manager and there's nowhere else to go in some of the sort of the medium sized facilities. Um, so this is something that those people are able to get their teeth um, into. Um, and it also gives you a range of other opportunities. So what this is, this is actually our tie-in back to raw life saving. So essentially the person who um, who is uh, essentially endorsed by Life Saving Victoria to these trainings um, and to deliver these skills also has, the also has the capacity to deliver some of these more traditional awards. Now, if you turn the clock back 25 years, you had to have a bronze medallion to be a poor lifeguard. As accredited training has come in, some of these things have become less relevant to us, but they're still just as relevant to the school kids. Okay, so there's the opportunity here to upskill your holiday programs, upskill your school programs, and just make them a little bit more interesting than just swimming and water safety. Okay, so you can get involved in, in things like the Bronze Star, the Bronze Medallion, the Bronze Cross. You're almost moving towards sort of that junior lifeguard program. It's far more interesting than just doing sort of a standard swimming lesson. They can practice rescues, they can practice toes, they can practice all of those sorts of things, um, and they can just learn a whole suite of um, of new skills. Um, same goes for resuscitation awareness, oxygen resuscitation, emergency life support. They're all non-accredited awards, so you don't need to be 
um, accredited as such, but you deliver it in partnership with LSV if you hold those award specific prerequisites, which, you, which we've kept as simple as, as possible. So we just wanted to introduce the, um, the Facility Champions Programme. It is one that we've spoken to um, at this sort of thing um, before, but we want to just make sure that, that people, whether they're new to the industry or coming back um, after a, a large chunk of last year sat at home, um, we want to make sure that everyone is aware that this is there and it is an opportunity to make sure that your in-service training um, can be cost effective, can be targeted and can be an opportunity to develop to some of the key people in your industries. And with that, we will jump to any questions. Anything online? All right, good stuffs. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, we'll continue to offer um, this PD series uh, on a quarterly basis. Um, we know that there's a lot going on. We know that everyone's still trying to get up on their uh, back up on their feet. Um, we're still working away and doing a lot of advocacy um, work behind the scenes, particularly in terms of um, ratios. And, and we're hoping that we might have some good news in the next couple of weeks with regards to how many people you're allowed back in your facilities, which we know is restricting um, access to swimming lessons in particular, um, but also access to um, particularly the pools that don't have the luxury of having four, five, six different pools, um, the actual capacity of you guys to, to open the doors to, to your locals. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you to those at home um, for tuning in. Thank you to those um, that are here who hopefully are going to hang around and have some lunch with us. And we look forward to um, seeing you again soon.